the average scientist. Making science accessible for everyone. Well, welcome back, everyone. We are back with another episode of the TAS podcast, which is season one, episode four. And as usual, I'm joined by um, one, one third, two thirds of the podcast crew, <laughs> including me. So as always, joined by uh, my beautiful co-host on camera at the moment that you can't see, but I can see in here, <laughs> Rebecca Ramberhol. Bex, welcome back. I'm always happy to be here. <laughs> we're, and we're always happy to have you as well. And hopefully later on we'll be joined um, by Bree, who is always a late comer to the podcast because we always seem to kick these things off while she's in the middle of working. So that's not intentional, <laughs> Bree. But um, we hopefully uh, will have Bree join us later. And this is the first time on the TAS podcast that we've had uh, a special guest. Normally we just kick these subjects around between the two or three of us, but we are extremely lucky today to have a special guest and he is a very special guest he's very special to us because he writes for us he presents live at our task talks and he will tell us at least once during this podcast that oil is not made of dinosaurs so welcome to the task podcast dame pavitt our paleontologist <laughs> Oh, I, I don't have to now. You've saved me the trouble. <laughs> well, we can't break the habit of a lifetime and only hear it once during a conversation about dinosaurs, surely. <laughs> I did actually say at the end of the last podcast that I was going to um, try and procure a little plastic dinosaur and then try to annoy you by telling uh, you that my plastic dinosaur was made of actual dinosaurs. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's it's no worse than a lot a lot of uh, my uh, a lot of my friends will deliberately try to wind me up by telling me that a pterodactyl is their favourite dinosaur. <laughs> Which is a whole branch of discussion that we can get onto. Should we? Uh, should we there are there are many rabbit holes or dinosaur holes that we might end up going down today, and I, I feel sure that oh, that's yeah. one of them. So this this episode is uh, a dinosaur one hundred and one, and I'm really looking forward to this because I love dinosaurs as much as the other uh, any other average. 40 year old child and <laughs> younger I suspect but I don't actually know terribly much about dinosaurs so I'm really looking forward to this and um, the episode itself you named didn't you this this particular episode so what did you call it yes uh, I called it dinosaur 101 from fossils yeah to feathers. and that's really cool because it sort of spans yeah, it, it sort of spans the range of, of topics. Paleontology is a bit of an odd science because it sort of sits in the Venn diagram between biology and geology. And then when you start getting into the depths of it, there's all sorts of aspects of you know, chemistry and earth science and environmental science. So it's actually quite a good um, it's quite a good gateway science. I've heard tell that there's people who work at NASA and other science institutions whose interest in science kicked off as a child because they were into dinosaurs or into paleontology um but yeah fossils feathers it takes you from like the very earliest discoveries of bones coming out of the rock all the way to the latest developments in uh, early bird evolution and how we we still have the dinosaurs around now in very different form to what we might expect yeah and that's probably a good place to start actually because one thing that i uh, have picked up from my time with you and i think um you know we spent a bit of time together in our live events and we've chatted about all manner of different things um aside from the things that we're supposed to be discussing during the task talks we have these chats in between and um i think a lot of people would probably think that if we think about the closest thing that we have to a dinosaur today you might think of an alligator or a rhino or something like that. But that's not the case, is it? Well, alligator's not okay. far off. So uh, dinosaurs are part of this larger group of reptiles called the archosaurs, which translates to ruling reptiles. And that includes the crocodiles and alligators. So on the family tree, the crocodiles and alligators are sort of the first cousins of the dinosaurs. Right. So you're not 100% off, but they are close relatives, but they are not themselves dinosaurs. Um, on the family tree, though, birds come off straight through the middle uh, of the dinosaur family tree. So there's, there's three major groups of dinosaurs, um, the sort of different classifications of them. Uh, there's the Ornithischians, which is quite a diverse group, which is 
mostly plant eating, although some of them may have also been omnivores. Um, they've all got beaks, as far as I know, and they're a very showy, flashy group of dinosaurs. They often have really elaborate armor and spikes and crests and horns coming off them. So this is things like uh, Triceratops, Stegosaurus, the uh, Ankylosaurs with all their armor plates on their back, um, things like Iguanodon and the Hadrosaurs, who've got these big hollow crests on their head, which we think are used for making noise. Um, the next group is my personal favorites, which is the sauropods, which are the big-bodied, four-legged, long-necked, long-tailed brontosaurus types. So Apatosaurus, Diplodocus, Brachiosaurus. Um, that also includes the super giant titanosaurs, which are the biggest animals that have ever walked the earth. Like nothing even comes close. The, the most conservative estimates of their size put them at 50, 60 wow. tons plus. Um, absolute monsters. How come I've never heard of this titan? Um, t- what is it, Titanosaurus? I've never the heard Titanosaurus. Of it. <laughs> yeah, so they're, they're yeah, they're, they're uh, what's the um, Diplodocus is Diplodocus and Brachiosaurus are probably the most famous ones. Um, Diplodocus in particular because um, there was one specimen that was um, cast and copied several times over and then shipped to museums all over the world. So Dippy the Diplodocus at the Natural History Museum in London is one of them. There's also one, I think there's one in Berlin. There's a bunch of them all over America. So they're a lot more famous. The titanosaurs were much later in the history of the dinosaurs. Um, and yeah, there's a few different species. Um, Argentinosaurus, Patagotitan, Puertosaurus. You're looking at 50, 60 tons at the lowest estimate, 30 to 40 meters long. You're talking whale-sized animals. Um, they make they make Dippy look like a Shetland pony. Um <laughs> <laughs> and then the uh, the third the third big group is the theropods, which is the two legged, mostly meat eating dinosaurs. So that's where you get your famous scary predators like T Rex, Allosaurus, and Spinosaurus, as well as lots of smaller creatures like Velociraptor and Oviraptor, which would have also had hollow bones and feathers, just like modern birds. And the birds sit right next to Velociraptor and its kin on the family tree. And there's actually quite a few fossil animals that are, they sit right on that boundary to the point where it's actually quite difficult to tell whether they sit on the bird side or the dinosaur side. There's one called uh, Balor, which was discovered in Romania. And different studies have picked it up on different sides. So depending on who you ask, it's either a dromaeosaur, which is the family that Velociraptor belongs to, or it's a flightless predatory bird. They are so physically similar to one another. The line between bird and dinosaur is actually quite blurry in some cases. That's that's massively interesting, isn't it? And do so. Do we have any kind of um, feathered animal or bird in the current natural world that lies as close to that dinosaur? Is that what you were just describing there? So, if you know, for people that are listening, what? what bird would they look at and think this is the closest relative to those dinosaurs that, you know, that roamed the earth millions of years ago? What's the, what's the closest one? Well, evolutionarily, they're all as separated from the point that they broke off. So the, the earliest birds are thought to have um, appeared sometime in the mid to late Jurassic. So about 150 yeah. odd million years ago. Um, so all birds would have descended from that. So they are all equally as descended but um, in terms of the, like, the family groups, as far as I know, I believe it's the palaeonaths um, and the ratites. So that's things like ostriches, emus, cassowaries. That sort of family group appeared quite early on in bird evolution. So you pro- so something like a cassowary is sort of your classic living dinosaur. It's a big flightless yeah. animal. It's got brightly colored head. It's got a big bony crest on its head. But I, in terms of sort of looking at a live animal and getting the vibe of a dinosaur, there's a few different things. There's um, the ground hornbill from Africa, which is this big black bird with this big sharp beak and bright red face. Um, There's a secretary bird as well from Africa, which is this long-legged bird of prey. And they sort of, they walk around on the ground picking off small animals from the undergrowth. That's kind of, that's very Velociraptor-like. They're very, very much living dinosaurs. Um, I had another one in my head as well, but it's completely past me. I think it was the cassowary. But yeah, so I'd say cassowary um, evolutionarily is quite close. And then ground hornbills and secretary birds, if you want to get the feeling of what a live dinosaur would be like. It's hugely interesting, isn't it? And I mean, the, these animals are not typically the type of thing that people would come across in the wild, unless perhaps you live in Africa. But they're certainly not the type of things that people would come across if they went to 
safari park or a conservation ex a conservation exercise like a zoo or something are they so where would we where would we aim to see these things if we wanted to see them in real life is it a case of having to go and observe these animals in their natural habitat or or do we have conservation <clears throat> projects which are uh, breeding and protecting these types of animals are, are they are they in danger i believe if uh, protected at least, yeah. I believe in terms of the UK. I say I can't speak for the for the for the states for Rebecca, but in the UK, I believe um, Longleat Safari down near Bath. I think they've got a couple of secretary okay. birds for a breeding program. Um, so if you're down in the south of England, that might be worth checking out. Uh, there's a few zoos that have got cassowaries and emus um, in the UK. Um, ostriches. I, I was actually at Westman Safari just a few weeks ago with the family, and they've, they've got ostriches, and they can walk right up to your car, and they absolutely tower over you. You absolutely like the just the height of them. You absolutely get the dinosaur feeling <laughs> off them. Yeah, actually, I am lucky enough to have um, to be, to have been to that safari park too, and uh, yeah, I can definitely testify to being terrified by the size. Of the absolutely <laughs> terrified. I mean, yeah, they are. In- the- they're big enough to ride. Yeah, absolutely. Waste them. Yeah, and, and yeah, and that <laughs> thought did cross my mind briefly, but um, only very briefly. And that one thing that uh, yeah, you wouldn't one thing try. that I I've, I've enjoyed doing on the podcasts that I've done both for Tass and for other people. And when I talk about um, space and the universe and things like that, I I love you know kind of um, trying to get across to people articulating to my audiences or my listeners some of the time spans that are involved in the the evolution of the universe because they are massive and some of the distance between the stars and one thing that really blows my mind and maybe you'll be i, I realize i'm putting you on the spot a little bit here um <laughs> but, <laughs> that's why i'm here one of the fine. things that i f- found fascinating um and i'm sure it's true was this fact that um somebody gave me an example of two dinosaurs and i can't remember what the two dinosaurs were but they actually i i know this this is a this is the classic the uh, that that um t-rex that t-rex is closer to the ipad than it is yes, to stegosaurus that's exactly what i'm thinking of now that actually blows <laughs> my mind can you just try and i mean just try and give us a, a sense of time for these things because that is yeah, that is an in, incredibly astonishing fact as far as i'm concerned yeah so so what yeah what well to sort of to sort of expand on that that image to sort of give you an idea of the success of the dinosaurs the dinosaurs were around for longer than they have been extinct or the non-avian wow. ones at least you know they've they've been gone for six, they've been gone for 66 yes. million years but they first appeared about 240 million years ago so mid triassic period so nearly nearly double the length that they've been extinct um and then yeah, you know, when you start and then you start going past that as well, you know, di- dinosaurs are still a snapshot of life on Earth. When yeah, you know, they um, part of their part of the reason for their success was that they evolved just after a huge mass extinction right. event, um, far worse, far worse than the one that took them out. Dinosaurs were famously taken out by an asteroid impact, uh, but about two hundred fifty million years ago, the Earth went through an even worse mass extinction caused by this huge surge in volcanic activity. Where um, I think it was, an, I think it was something like seven million square kilometers of land in Russia basically boiled over into volcanic eruptions that were nonstop for about two million years, and all that CO two and greenhouse gases basically cooked the planet, and somewhere between eighty and ninety percent of all life died out, which included a lot of really big, really weird animals that weren't. They were neither reptile nor mammal. They were very odd creatures that I could do a whole episode <laughs> on these things as well. These very strange pre-dinosaur animals that then, you know, this was, you know, there were big herbivores and big carnivores around before the dinosaurs showed up and then the slate got wiped clean and that kind of gave dinosaurs the platform. They had an empty, you know, it was, it was like a, you know, huge job vacancies opened up and the dinosaurs rushed into it. Um, presumably that one of the sort of, schools of thought as to why is because they had an advantage over the other reptiles of the time that they had an active metabolism they were warm-blooded to put it in the yeah. common terms so they were able to maintain high levels of activity at times when other reptiles had to wait for their body heat to warm up with the sun okay i have a question <laughs> go for it okay my mind is already blown 
Um, I did not know that there was there were creatures before the dinosaurs. How come oh, yeah. no one told me this? It was like it was dinosaurs, asteroid, and then us. That's a... yeah. Oh, there's oh yeah. The the dinosaurs is one chapter, not just before but after as well. There's this whole period after the dinosaurs called the Cenozoic. And you, you, so you've got to remember, you know, dinosaurs went extinct 66 million years ago. So that's 66 million years of other stuff before you get to us as well. The law, so all sorts of weird mammals uh, have existed in that time. But yeah, pre-dinosaur, uh, the earliest confirmed fossils, and they're very simple things. It's like cyanobacteria. They go back about three and a half billion years. But that's like very simple, like, yeah, bacteria, algae, essentially. But in terms of complex multicellular life you're looking about 540 million years ago i think it was it's um called the cambrian explosion which is basically all the pieces fell into place um you had algae creating oxygen and that was controlling the temperature of the atmosphere and about 540 million years ago all the conditions lined up perfectly and there was this explosion of complex organisms you had early arthropods and mollusks and things really weird alien looking things there's 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 one called um opabinia which is like a shrimp with five eyes and its mouth is on the end of a hose what? and yeah really really where are the really pictures, are the pictures? I, don't... <laughs> I would like to know what these look like <laughs> Oh, they are they are utterly bizarre but yeah and so from that point as you progress through time they animals you know more and more animals evolve and they gradually become more and more recognizable still very weird and prehistoric like um you know jaws didn't exist for a couple of hundred million years animals basically fed by filter feeding and things like that and then when the first jaws did appear the the, uh, the way they evolved teeth there's a group of fish called the placoderms um so there's this massive prehistoric fish called dunkleosteus which is about five or six meters long so great white shark size and instead of having teeth, the jaw bones would sharpen each other along their own edge. They'd like slice along each other. Really weird, <laughs> gnarly stuff. Uh, but yeah, there's 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 a whole world of bizarre fossil animals pre and post dinosaur and adjacent to the dinosaurs. There were all sorts of things. Okay, I want I want to know where well, I can but... learn more about these these things. These pre dinosaur adjacent uh, dinosaur. I want to know where we were. <laughs> Oh yeah, there's there's all sorts of books. Uh, uh, let me just hang up. Apologies for the microphone. I'm look over my shelf. Uh, where is it? Uh, oh, I can't read the title. There's all sorts. There's all sorts of books you can get. Uh, what we'll do, Dane. Yeah, I'll uh, I'll I'll send I'll send, stuff, I'll send you yes. a reading list. What we'll, what we'll do, Dane, is we'll yeah. have to uh, we'll have to create a like a reading list and get some ISBN numbers or some links and put them in the podcast description afterwards. Yes. Because I think that would be helpful to people. And just for any for anyone that was oh, yeah. listening to that section there about jaws sharpening each other, happy bedtime stories, kids. <laughs> <laughs> Dane is, oh yeah, don't yeah, don't yeah. Be <laughs> Dunkley Osteos is a monster. Dane is available to um, chat to your children just before bedtime if you'd like him to, <laughs> or for the purposes of education. Oh, that's 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 not that's not even half as weird as some of the jaw and tooth arrangements. That like the, there's a there's a shark called Helicoprion whose teeth are arranged in a spiral. It's so weird. It's so cool. <laughs> we, need to, we need to see some of these pictures, don't we? We need to see some of these pictures. <laughs> oh yeah. That's utterly bizarre. It, it, it took them about 50 years because because sharks don't have bony skeletons. They're made of cartilage, so they don't tend to fossilize very well. So all they would find were just these spirals of teeth just isolated in the fossils. And it took them about 50 or 60 years to figure out how it fitted in the <laughs> wow. face. Wow. <laughs> that is oh crazy. And I, I've, I've definitely got a question, Dane. Um, and that is, so God. as you as you mentioned there, there was a, a mass, extinct, mass extinction event um just prior to the emergence of dinosaurs which kind of left this job vacancy as you described it for those guys to move into and then they were around for a good period of time 240 million years or so and then we have um what is widely perceived to be the extinction event which caused um complete eradication of the d dinosaurs which was the meteorite strike the asteroid strike in uh, at the Yucatan Peninsula so at that point, we've got these enormous creatures that are roaming the earth, these titanosaurs that you told us about earlier. So <clears throat> following that period, why don't we see animals of that size anymore? What's changed to 
kind of stop those massive 40, 50 ton creatures coming back again? What, what is, what's the blocker? So it's, it's a combination of environment and biology. Uh, I will put one thing right in the bud immediately. Is one of, one of the, this is another one of those oft-repeated bits of misinformation yep. that I hear, which is when people say that there was more oxygen back in prehistory so things yep. could get, get bigger. That only applies to arthropods, so things like insects and arachnids and millipedes and things like that because of the way they absorb oxygen through their exoskeleton. It doesn't I'm really, pleased, to... I'm really pleased you said that because <laughs> Sorry, um, I think on an, uh, an earlier podcast episode, I'd alluded to um, something very similar when I was talking to people about how life might have sprung up on other planets. And a greater concentration of oxygen does mean supersized bugs. And uh, that's, that's exactly what you're yes. saying there, isn't it? When oxygen is absorbed yes. through the surface of the skin, I'm going to call it, the exoskeleton, then yep. that is what creates a, a larger size. But if you've got a respiratory system, then that isn't the case, is it? Yeah. So the the l- lungs and the well, we'll get on to l- so lung, lungs is a big part of it. Um, so partially, one idea is that the um, the vegetation at the time was on average higher nutrients. Um, so grass, as we know it, is sort of the dominant, one of the dominant plants of yep. the current times. It didn't really become dominant until within the last 20 million years or so. Um, and one of the reasons it's so dominant is it's actually quite low in nutrition, so it doesn't need a lot to grow. So grass can grow very quickly in very poor soil. It can cover huge areas. And it's a very abundant food source, if not a very good one, which is why so many grazing animals exist today. And it's also why they have to spend so many hours a day eating, because they have to get a lot of it in to get any nutrients back. Whereas during the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, it was a lot of ferns and angiosperms and conifer trees and things like that. So on average, the plants were a lot more nutritious. Um, And then you get into the physiology of the dinosaurs themselves, particularly the sauropods, Um, And basically, the animals themselves were hollow. Um, So birds today, they have uh, hollow spaces in their bones, which helps make them lightweight to help them fly. They also have this um, system of air chambers that not only fills up the bones, but also expands into the the chest cavity and connects to the lungs. It's this really weird, advanced respiratory system that is both weight-relieving and it's also more efficient. So with our lungs, we breathe in, we exchange the oxygen and we breathe out. So half the time that we're breathing, we've got dead air in our lungs, essentially. The way that this bird-style respiratory system works is that the air goes into these chambers in the bones, which don't exchange oxygen, they just store the air. Then they go into the lungs, the lungs extract the oxygen, and then they move out to a separate tube. So rather than the air coming in and out of the same tube, they've basically got a tube at each end, an in and an out, which means that Whichever way they're breathing, there's a constant flow of fresh air going through the lungs, um, and that's a big um, that's a big advantage uh, in terms of just getting you know, getting more oxygen into your system because that helps you metabolize your food more efficiently. It helps you to you know your red blood cells. It helps you grow. It helps you heal quicker. Um, and then just the weight relieving properties. You know you've got these you know the, the the titanosaurs for example. They've got these huge huge bones, particularly. Um, the bones in the head and the spine and the ribs in particular have all these hollow chambers in them. They could be up to 90% air by volume. So, you know, as the, you know they are 30, 40 meters long, which is whale size, but the you know, a blue whale can easily weigh 150, 200 tons, which, you know, is two or three times as heavy as the sauropods. This is why we, you know, we always say the blue whale is the biggest animal of all time, because even though it might not be as long as some of these dinosaurs, there is more yeah. mass there. Um, so that's, that's a big contributing factor as to why modern animals don't quite get that big, is because mammals don't have this air chamber system in their bodies. They are much more solid. They are much more robustly built. There were still giant mammals in the past, so about... 20, 30 million years ago, there was an animal called uh, Paraceratherium, which was a kind of rhino-related animal. It didn't have a horn, but it had really long legs, a really long neck. It was very odd looking. That was maybe 10, 15 tons. It would have been about four or five meters to the top of the head. Um, There's also Paleoloxodon, which is a giant elephant, which used to live in the UK as well. 
that was yeah again about five five meters to the top of the head probably 15 to 20 tons about so about the same roughly the same size but yeah physically um mammals can't achieve that size because yeah again they're more solid in the body and then there's also the question of um, metabolisms um, one of the big mysteries surrounding the giant sauropods and it's, it's one of the questions that i'm most interested in is what were they doing with their metabolism this is the whole were dinosaurs warm-blooded or cold-blooded argument for starters they're not all going to be doing the same thing because there's so many different body sizes and they live in so many different environments they're not all going to be doing the same thing but the sauropods in particular seem to be doing something very very odd um so in terms of their growth there's a baby titanosaur fossil from madagascar that was discovered a few years back um it was they worked out from the bone chemistry of it that it was only three months old when it died, but it was already the size of a twelve year old wow. child, and they're 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 born about the same size, so four or five kilos when they're born, and it's rocketed up to this huge size, which says that they they have a really fast active energy intensive yeah. metabolism if they maintain that to adult size they would not be able to sustain themselves on end, like the food that they would need. They'd just burn out. They wouldn't be able to sustain themselves. So what are they doing? Are they changing their metabolism? Are they becoming sort of cold-blooded as they get bigger? Because then you run into um, surface area and volume with you know, like heat management. It's, it, I, I'm, I, just, I don't think either of you have spoken for about 10, 10 yeah, minutes. That's okay. That's <laughs> okay. This is some yeah. really riveting stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, so yeah, there's there's this idea of um, gigantothermy, which um, some sharks and crocodiles do this, where instead of having an active burning metabolism, by virtue of being huge, they just retain heat because they have such a small surface area by comparison. There's nowhere for the heat to escape to. So they don't actually need as much energy as you would expect a warm-blooded mammal of that size because they, they just kind of hold on to the heat that their muscles make and that their digestive system makes. So, yeah, it's, it's a combination of um, new availability of nutrition, um, weight relief in their skeletons, and really weird metabolic processes. Uh, this, is, this is why sauropods are my favorite because they, they just they're like super optimized. Like there's, there's no such thing as peak evolution, but if I was to give any animal that title, it's, it's the super giant titanosaurs. It is probably a slight relief that we don't have creatures of that size roaming around. <laughs> I mean, uh, I've had a, I had a conversation. Oh, yeah. uh, I can't remember whether it was with Bex or whether it was Brie, with Brie actually um, earlier on this week or maybe even last week about how lucky we are in the UK not to have a huge number of dangerous creatures roaming around in the wild. So, you know, we have a very low number of poisonous snakes, um, certainly not really any dangerous spiders. I mean, the last thing that we want is a a six meter elephant that's kind of wandering around the countryside. I I mean, I don't want to, I quite like to see that from from distance perhaps. (laughs) Oh yeah. Well, this, this is the weird thing. It's, it's, um, the, the megafauna that used to exist in the UK, even very recently, it's part of, they sort of shape the environment that we're used to today. You know, part of the reason that we can coppice tree, you know, you can cut down a tree, you can twist it, you can mangle it, you can coppice it into shapes with, you know, if you're doing you know, garden decoration or something, and it will grow back, it will recover itself. It's because they're used to getting smashed up by elephants and rhinos <laughs> and things. It's it's a weirdly missing part of our ecosystem. It is quite yeah, and I, I guess whenever I think of dinosaurs, I think of um, lots of vegetation, obviously because you get the herbivores, and you think of um, warm environments predominantly. Now, I mean, Tass is quite um, an, an Anglo Canadian. Um, organization we have at least 50 percent of our staff based in canada now and canada's quite a cold and snowy country in places so what what would have been happening in those types of areas so places where it was very cold would we still have had dinosaurs in those places and what, what does that look like so we do have dinosaurs living in cold environments. There's a, there's quite a lot of fossils in Canada. Canada is uh, uh, Edmund, uh, Edmonton's quite good for fossils for dinosaurs, um, and even way up in Alaska as well. Um, there was quite an interesting one a few years back where they actually found uh, the teeth of baby dinosaurs way up in uh, Alaska, 
which tells you not only so we know that dinosaurs are living in cold environments so and you know the thought was well yeah they're migrating there during the summer and then when it gets too cold they migrate out but the presence of these baby dinosaur teeth says that they're actually nesting there they are living in the cold throughout their lives they've got they have a tolerance for the cold um there's also uh, in northeastern China would have been quite cold during the Cretaceous, and that's where we find uh, an animal called Euteranus, which is the it's the biggest dinosaur with confirmed evidence of feathers. Um, it's a tyrannosaur, so a close relative of T. Rex, somewhere about seven or eight meters long, probably weighed the best part of a ton and a half, and it's the the specimen is it's two of them side by side, and they are. Nose to tail, head to toe, completely covered in this kind of shaggy winter coat. Um, there's even dinosaurs in Antarctica. Um, there's not a lot of research done there because it's a horrible place to go by all accounts. Um, but yeah, places like Seymour Island and Ross Island, are these sort of ice-free places on the Antarctic Peninsula. Yeah, there's there's dinosaurs found there that would have, they, yeah, they'd have been living there year round during the cold, uh, or possibly migrating through um, South America and Australia because they were connected at the time. Uh, but yeah, dinosaurs were, they were absolutely living, yeah, living there year round. They were thriving, um, yeah. full winter coats. That's um, the last one I was going to actually yeah, was, ask you about the connection. You're talking about Pangaea? Is that what it's called? Yeah, so. Pangaea, yeah. So, well, I mean, did all those dinosaurs lived in Pangaea at the time and then the asteroids came and like. They- <laughs> so. Pangea, Pang, there is, yeah, again, this is another bit of a misconception that Pangaea was a kind of a constant throughout the age of the Mesozoic. Pangaea formed just before that big mass extinction event that I mentioned earlier, the sort of pre dinosaur mass extinction. Um, so Pangaea is all the major continents are mushed together into big one big landmass. That started to break apart in the early to mid Jurassic. So, about between about 200 and 150 million years ago, it started to break apart mostly down the middle. So the Atlantic mm-hmm. started separating it. Um, South America started drifting off on its own, but it was connected to South America and Australia. So there was one, so it was weird. It was one big, there was a, a big Southern continent that was South America, Antarctica, and Australia, which is the reason we get possums in South America and Australia. They crossed Antarctica to get between these two. It's why you get marsupials in these two places. Um, yeah, we have possums. Yeah, so, Is that the same thing? Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So yeah. So yeah. So so Australia, Antarctica, and South America were connected up, and marsupials were moving freely between them. Then they disconnected from Antarctica, and then South America connects with North America, and okay. the possums okay. move in that way. Um, so yeah, marsupials used to have a much wider distribution than they have these days. Um, but yeah, by the end of the Cretaceous, when the asteroid hit, the continents were not far off where they are now. South America was an island on its own. India was an island in the middle of the Indian Ocean that was slowly drifting northward. Uh, Europe was an island chain. Um, there were no uh, ice caps at the poles. They were cold, but there was no ice caps, which means the sea levels were a lot higher. And a lot of Europe was underwater, which is why so many of the fossils that we get in the UK from this time are of fish and marine reptiles and ammonites and things like that yeah it's, it's interesting to to understand that kind of um the the evolution of the land masses isn't it because i think it is something that we don't always give enough thought to i think there's quite a lot of um quite a lot of talk and quite a lot of study on kind of the evolution of the universe star space planets the solar system and then we all automatically assume to some extent that the earth has always been as we as we know it today so yeah to to hear about that actually uh, and um, in an, another thing that i kind of quite enjoy telling people as well from an astrophysical point of view is that the dinosaurs actually lived on the opposite side of the galaxy which is pretty pretty, pretty oh pretty cool that's thing, weird pretty cool <laughs> thing to think about <laughs> so uh, whilst they were well yeah you can you can you can see the evidence of it in the in the geology. So, so like I mentioned, so North America, Europe, Africa, they, you know, the Atlantic Ocean basically didn't exist at the beginning of the Mesozoic, um, and so you can actually find the um, the Atlas Mountains in West Africa, the Appalachian Mountains in um, the northeast of North America, and the Scottish Islands 
all used to be connected. They all used to be just one big mountain range that then got separated. And you, so you'd find the same kind of rocks in these three really far apart separated locations. So when you were talking about the um, the dinosaurs that were living in the cold environments, presumably these would have been carnivores predominantly living. We have we have herbivores as well. We've got quite there's quite a few herbivores as well. It wouldn't it wouldn't have been a total snowscape right. like we see sort of in the Arctic these days. It would have been sort of boreal forests, so sort of pine yeah. forests. Sort of um I think like Vancouver Island in winter to sort of stick with the, stick uh, with stick the, with the Canada theme. theme. So yeah, it would have been like yeah. yeah. So like like yeah, there would have been pine trees and ferns. There would have been plenty for them to eat. But yeah, we get um uh there's a uh, there's a tyrannosaur from the far north in um North America called Nanaxaurus. Um there's a uh, there's a hadrosaur called Edmontosaurus, which is absolutely huge. It's a tyrannosaurus size, that's so like 10, 12 meters long. Um, there's a really cool ceratops. So the horned dinosaurs yep. like triceratops. There's one from Alaska called Pachyrhinosaurus, which instead of having horns on its face, it's just got this massive lump <laughs> of bone in the middle of its head, like a just like a mace. <laughs> so instead of stabbing, it's just sort of hammering. What use is that? Um, <laughs> hammering. <laughs> well, it's it's sort of like um, I'm think. Well, I said, I'm thinking like um, the I think the equivalent would be something like muskox or um, mountain goats, kind of like okay. slamming okay. their heads. Okay, but where into each where are their eyes? Like on the, like so that's right in the middle on the side. The eyes are on. The eyes are on the, uh, the eyes okay. are on the side of the head. So this is the cla- okay. this is a classic thing where herbivores have their eyes on the sides to look out for danger. Carnivores have their eyes facing forwards for oh, binocular vision. Okay, I didn't and know I that. I think that that's makes cool. a nice. No- <laughs> That makes quite a nice little segue, I think, into um, an area that I think, you know, for certainly for mainstream interest in dinosaurs, people are really interested to find out more mm. um, about the apex predators. So typically things that we would think of like Tyrannosaurus or Velociraptor, two very different sized dinosaurs, but ferocious predators so i I think it might be uh, i think just to humor my own um you know kind of intrigue i'd quite like to find out a little bit more about those apex predators because you know we've all seen films like jurassic park or whatever that give depictions of these different types of ferocious creatures but how realistic is that and i mean how ferocious was a, a dinosaur like tyrannosaurus or a much smaller dinosaur like velociraptor what what kind of what kind of stuff would that have been having a go at for a meal? I mean, is it anything? Are the, are the gloves off there? So, or did it, was the Velociraptor kind of thinking, oh, well, no, we, I'm going to oh, pick my... Velociraptor, there, there is a, there's a very special fossil of a, of a Velociraptor. Um, first of all, well, sorry, we'll address the Jurassic Park thing. Jurassic Park, some things it got right, some things it really didn't. Velociraptor <laughs> is the classic one. Where the Velociraptor in Jurassic Park is about <laughs> five times bigger than <laughs> yeah, the real yeah, thing, yeah. it would have been it would have it would have been about waist height, covered in feathers, um, not the apex predator in its um, in its environment. That go for for work. So Velociraptor lived in Central Asia, so sort of Mongolia, yeah. China area. The big predator at the time there was Tarbosaurus, which is very similar to T Rex, very similar animal. Um, but uh, but yeah, as far as hunting, yeah, there's a very special Velociraptor fossil um, because it's not a Velociraptor on its own. It's also with a Protoceratops. So you might gather from the name, similar to Triceratops, but about about the size of a large right. sheep, maybe, and it doesn't have the horns. It's just got this big sort of parrot beak. There's a fossil called the <coughs> Fighting Dinosaurs that was discovered in Mongolia, and it is literally a Velociraptor and a Protoceratops in the middle of a fight. And apparently they got they got caught in a landslide or a sandstorm or something, and it just buried them as they were. So the fossil is literally the Velociraptor on its back with the they've got the big hook yeah. claw on the foot, and it's burying that in the Protoceratops's belly, and the Protoceratops has got its beak latched onto the Velociraptor's arm, and they just got buried. <laughs> that, like that is very cool. So, is there a picture somewhere? <laughs> so yeah, look. Oh yeah, yeah. Go- Google the, the fighting, fighting dinosaurs. Dying. It's it's a real. <laughs> It's a really spectacular fossil. Um, and yeah, for, for T-Rex, yeah, we've got evidence for hunting from T-Rexes. Um, there's, uh, there's he, well, this, this is another big debate is whether T-Rex was a hunter yeah. or a scavenger. Based on basically every other carnivorous animal alive today, it would have done both. 
the o- the only vertebrates alive today that are exclusively scavengers are vultures, and that's because they can travel long distances without using a lot of energy. If T Rex was to do that, it'd have to walk for miles and miles and miles over uncertain terrain to get a meal. Um, but no, we've got um, bite marks on the bones of things like Triceratops and Edmontosaurus that um, that match the tooth profile of Tyrannosaurus. Uh, some of which have healed, which again is evidence that it was you know, it was attacked when it was alive. So this was a predatory response. There's also a trend in carnivorous dinosaurs, which is consistent with living predators in that they mainly target younger animals. Yeah, a fully grown Triceratops, you know, that's seven or eight ton animal with meter and a half long horns. It's going to be a dangerous thing to go up against. So you quite often find with injuries on dinosaurs or even dinosaur coprolites which is fossil droppings they tend to contain the bones of baby dinosaurs because they're less experienced they're less well defended they're easier to chase after uh, so yeah t- t-rex definitely the apex predator in its ecosystem t-rex had a very weird effect on the food chain where it lived um, so you think of sort of the african savannah yeah you've got you've sort of got lions at the top and then you've got leopards and cheetahs and jackals and hyenas you have all these sort of similar sized predators beneath them with t-rex you've got t-rex and then nothing and then the next biggest predator is something about the size of a velociraptor and the thinking of that is is that the young t-rexes are filling that space in the food chain they're hunting different prey to the adults and they're kind of filling out the food chain that way so t- yeah t-rex was really weird in its ecology and yeah totally dominated the landscapes it was living in so that i guess that addresses that question because i think everyone who is a kind of lay person that would come into having a chat about dinosaurs would typically think that t-rex was the the most ferocious dinosaur if you like the 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 typical apex predator top of the food chain and you're kind of reinforcing that aren't you saying that is the case but actually interestingly yeah. a young t-rex is still an extremely dangerous dinosaur in that in that kind of oh, landscape. Yeah. They were they were built quite differently. T T Rex had a really weird growth pattern. Um, they, we've got we do have skeletons of sub adult T Rexes, sort of teenagers, and they're really leggy. They've got really long, really slender legs, whereas the adults tend to be quite a bit yeah. more robust. And the thinking is that the, the younger T-Rexes, they're a lot faster. They're going after the smaller, faster animals, whereas the fully grown T-Rexes, they're not as fast. They're more long-distance runners, and they're chasing after the bigger yeah, animals. Yeah, sure. But cl- clearly to get a bigger meal as well, I would imagine, just to maintain that, you know, oh, yeah. because of the enormous you know, the enormous size of these types of animals. I mean, I think oh, yeah. another thing that I think that I find interesting is, um, and I don't know, don't know the answer to this at all. So it's handy that we've got you on for me to ask. Um, but um, how, what sort of level of intelligence would we have given dinosaurs? And I've got quite an amusing kind of anecdote about this, if you like. So, um, t- you know, typically we think of dolphins as being very intelligent creatures. Um, certainly, I've spoken to one or two marine biologists, and they are telling me that. Uh, uh, and it, there, there are ranges of intelligence with dolphins, but it's probably comparable to maybe a four or five year old child um, in terms of learning, you know, <clears throat> learning ability, that type of thing. Right up to the point where um, I actually spent some time at London Zoo, uh, which was really interesting. And um, one of my good friends actually is uh, is a zoologist, and she she had a really cool job at Colchester Zoo and then moved to London Zoo. And uh, so I went on a kind of special behind-the-scenes visit to London Zoo a little while ago, a few years ago now, and I spent most of the time being fascinated by arachnids. This is like a big... I've, I've absolutely not got arachnophobia. I, lo- I actually quite quite love <laughs> arachnids. So if I ever get a spider in my house or anything like that, I do tend to try and leave them, which is not for everyone. Um, but if I am if I am going to have to <laughs> eject a spider from the house, I will humanely catch it and i will do that in my hands and um i'm quite quite happy oh yeah yeah I quite I'm, happy. I'm the same i'm i'm very i'm very much the spider yes, absolutely and I'm, I'm very happy to do that actually very happy to i don't mind um you know don't mind spiders so but one thing when i was talking to um you know kind of the arachnid expert <clears throat> at london zoo um and and this guy was telling me that let don't 
fool yourself into thinking that any of these arachnids uh, have got any level of emotional attachment to a human being whatsoever. Like, if you put your hand near it, it's food or danger, always. <laughs> these are, like, the only two things. So where, yeah. do, where do our dinosaurs sit on this kind of intelligence scale? How big were their brains? Clearly not uh, anywhere near as in proportion to the size of their body. But what, what sort of level of intelligence would we have given the, these different groups, maybe, that you're talking about? Yeah, so th- this has been a really complex um, field of study yeah. for a while. Um, it's one one thing is quite handy is um, reptile skulls. This is so this is something that mammal skulls don't have, which is what makes us an oddity. Is reptile skulls have a brain yeah. case, which is basically like a, a mini skull inside the skull that conforms almost one to one to the size of the brain. It's like a protective yeah. shield. So. On a really well-preserved skull, you can basically model the shape of the brain and get an idea of its volume. Um, there was a study that came out, a year, I think it last year, uh, that tried to make the assessment that T-Rex was as intelligent as a baboon. That one didn't go down very well. It, it was There were some dodgy numbers involved in like neuron density yeah. and things like that. Um, it's difficult to say. They were probably smarter than we give them credit for there is they say there's evidence of um parental yeah. care um which you know that requires you know some level of intelligence some level of attachment there's um you know there's there's um footprint tracks of herding behavior there's even footprint tracks of um mating dances which is really exciting. i think it was found in colorado where they basically had the footprints of two theropods so big meat eaters and they were standing face to face and making these symmetrical scratching marks in the ground, like some birds do during mating rituals. So, but yeah, it's it's a difficult one to say. The the general contender for the smartest dinosaurs is a group called the Troodontids, which is a group very close to Velociraptor. So, sort of small, lightly built carnivorous. They have really big eyes, which um, some have interpreted means they might have been yeah. nocturnal. Um, and they've got quite fairly big brain cases for their size. I wouldn't go so far as sort of dolphin or primate or anything like that. I think modern birds of prey are probably a good analogy. You, you could probably train one. Um, and then when you get to the big herbivores, you get the the, the brain to body ratio goes out <laughs> the window. Um, but then you have to wonder, like, you know, how, how much brain power does it really take to walk around and eat and you know meet your your basic body functions the big sauropods in particular we think they're probably not looking after their infants purely because of the size difference you know they they hatch four or I five kilograms Dane's connection and the has just are... dropped out for us there oh there you're back Dane. Oh. you're back. sorry oh, maybe, maybe you could just reco- maybe you could just recover oh. that bit for us yeah so uh, we think the um, the big sauropods probably weren't looking after their babies purely because of the size discrepancy. Yeah. Uh, discrepancy. Um, it'd just be really, really impractical to try and look after them with that kind of size difference. Um, yeah, it's it's a, it's a difficult one. I, I think for the small feathered carnivores, you could probably look at a bird of prey as a reasonable analog. But for yeah, the big herbivores, big big herbivorous animals today, so things like cattle and and hippos and things like that maybe, maybe you know not super smart but then they don't really need yeah. to be if they don't have very complicated social so do you behaviors. think it would be fair to say that um in the in measure of intelligence was maybe more of a maybe a more, more of a measure of cunning so like the more intelligent dinosaurs would have been the yeah, predators because that's the predatory behavior takes yeah thought processing and reasoning and planning yeah. doesn't it all these things that we would associate with the onset of yeah. a higher degree of intelligence because they were hunting things that were also probably quite cunning and um does that would that be fair to say? yeah it would have it would have taken it, yeah it would have taken a level of sort of memory and yeah. learning and experience and trial and error and yeah binocular vision takes quite a bit of brain processing yeah. power so yeah, I think on average the carnivores were probably more intelligent than the herbivores. But again, it's it's a you know soft tissue stuff and organs. It's very rare that they preserve, so it is quite sure, difficult yeah. to 
extract any real numbers okay, out of it. I have a couple of questions, if that's okay. <laughs> yeah. Yep. So you were talking, Never. I have two questions. You can choose to answer one or both. <laughs> um, you mentioned mating. Um, and right away I thought of these huge brontosaurs. Do they mate like? How animals mate, or is there something well, they, different? They, they, they had, well, they, I was like, they, they, they had to. But how? Yeah, they, they, they had to reproduce. <laughs> this, the genuinely, this has been something that people have tried, been trying to figure out. The real, the real challenging one is Stegosaurus. Like that's a, that's a logistical nightmare to try and figure oh, out. Oh, you don't really know. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's one of those where it's like, yeah, we yeah. they must have done. They, they it yeah. had to happen, but God knows how. There was one. There was one suggestion. I, I think I read somewhere that someone suggested that in Stegosaurus, the female would lie down on her mm-hmm. side on the ground, and that that would be <laughs> the easiest <laughs> method of access. Okay, um, but yeah, it, it. But yeah, the the. But yeah, when when you're looking at the the the, the sauropods, you know, fifty, sixty yeah. tons plus, and then you imagine like if they try to breed in a way mm-hmm. like modern animals the female's got to carry an extra 50 or 60 tons oh, on her God. back and you can think like the pre- like the the yeah. forces involved there like yeah it's, it's okay so, really, that's, yeah. so that's so uh... that, that one's a that's a that one's still okay 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 air, good yeah. good and i have one other question so i'm a i love the ocean so is there anything cool you can tell me about like the dinosaurs from the ocean like so dinosaurs never really went in for the ocean uh, because it was already yeah. occupied. There were lot, there were lots of really big, really scary things living in the ocean early on. So sort of Triassic, so in the sort of two hundred million year range, there's a group called the ichthyosaurs, which literally translates as fish lizards because they look like sharks. They literally have a dorsal fin like a shark. They've got a crescent moon shaped tail like a shark. Um, and they were sort of the whales and dolphins of their time. Some of them were quite small, fast moving, you know, snapping up little fish. Uh, there's a group called the, oh, is it the Shastasaurs or the Shonosaurs? They're basically, there's two really massive ichthyosaurs that are pushing sort of humpback whale size, sort of 15, 20 meters long, really, really huge things. There's also, uh, throughout the Jurassic and the Cretaceous, there's the Plesiosaurs, which is, for lack of a better description, your Loch Ness monster types. So big round body, four big flippers, really long, mm. thin neck, and a little head on the end, full of sharp teeth. They were really common all over the world. Um, and then there's the Mosasaurs, which are they were the top predators in the ocean during the latter days of the dinosaurs. They were their closest relatives are actually probably things like monitor lizards and snakes. Um, they've actually got the um, they've got the holes in the roof of their mouth where they'd have a forked tongue mm. for collecting scent from the water. But they they had they were sort of roughly crocodile like in build, but they had flippers instead of legs, and they had a big paddle on the tail. The biggest ones of them, ten fifteen meters, easy. So yeah, again, sort of mid whale size. Um, and we've got some of them uh, with remains of what they've eaten in their bellies in the fossils so they were eating fish sharks turtles pterosaurs um other mosasaurs yeah they just they they were the t-rex of the ocean at the time and are you are you finding their fossils in the water or is it after like when it's dried out no it's it's so so the mosasaurs in particular there's um there's this thing called the western interior seaway um so Mentioned earlier, there was no ice caps at this time, so the ocean levels were a lot higher. During the latter days of the dinosaurs, North America was split down the middle by this huge inland sea. So it was a sort of shallow, really warm tropical sea. It was full of life. There was all sorts, like not just the big marine reptile, like there were turtles, there was giant predatory fish, there were seabirds, all sorts of stuff. And then, of course, over time, as the ice caps have formed, that the sea levels have receded and the water has gone away. There are fossils underwater. There was a story from, uh, I think it was in the North Sea, there was a drilling operation for um, an oil rig, and they they have to take these um, core samples of the ocean floor. They drill in like a big cylinder and pull it up. And there was a dinosaur fossil in this at the bottom of the sea. We're never going to see the rest of it, because like, how, how would you go about that? How, you, know, you can't really take a fossil trip to the bottom of the ocean. But yeah, they, they are down okay, there. Cool. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's probably um, like now we've so we've talked about the land dinosaurs 
Bex has just mentioned um, the ocean. This might be a good point to revisit what you brought up right at the top of the podcast, which is if a pterodactyl is your favourite dinosaur, Dane is about to rain on your parade. So, <laughs> rain, rain away. <laughs> Yeah, so the pterosaurs, these are the big flying reptiles that lived at the same time as the dinosaurs. They are very they are closely related to dinosaurs in the same way that crocodiles and alligators are. They are archosaurs as well. They are part of that same group, but they branched off um, in the Triassic into their own group. Um, another again, really, really, really diverse. Their fossils are quite a bit rarer, um, we think, because they are really fragile. I mentioned that um, some dinosaurs had hollow spaces in their bones. Pterosaurs even more so. Pterosaurs are ridiculously hollow. They are extremely lightweight for their size. Um, and yeah, they came in all sorts of shapes and sizes. There were tiny little ones, like less than a meter wingspan, that we think were hunting insects at night. They were like bats. They had little short faces and big eyes, probably hunting at night. Uh, there were big um, sort of albatross-type ones. Uh, so Pteranodon is probably the most famous. So it's got a big, long beak and a big sort of crest horn coming off the back of its head. That was living in the interior seaway, catching fish. And then there's the Ashdarkids, which are the biggest and weirdest pterosaurs of all. They are, on the ground, they would have been as tall as a giraffe. And they had a 10 to 11 meter wingspan, so about spitfire sized. But they probably... But then I mentioned I mentioned the hollow bones. The biggest of them probably only weighed about 300 kilos. Wow. They were they were stupidly hollow, but they and then they had this massive beak. Imagine like a stork or a heron. Basically, they were basically shaped. They were shaped like giraffes. So if you imagine a giraffe with the head of a giant heron, that's basically what they looked like. But they were fully powered flyers. They had all the muscle attachments. They had these big extended wing fingers where they'd have this big elastic um, stretch of skin between their arms and legs. And uh, yeah, the interpretation is that they were sort of ground predators. They would have basically fly down to their prey and then chase them on ground. They would have actually been quite good on the ground. That's amazing. I can't, I can't even begin to imagine something of that size, of that being that lightweight, actually. It just doesn't make sense. When you think about dinosaurs, oh, yeah. you generally think about huge, heavy creatures, don't you? But to find out that some of these were enormous, but also incredibly lightweight as well. It's quite, and I guess they would have been because they're lightweight and obviously they can fly. Through, I guess they would have been quite fast as well through the air. Or are they more? Were they more gliders? Yeah, there's, there's, How there's does that work? No, they they were all powered as far as far as we can tell. There are no. Well, some of them would have been good soarers. The um, there's sort of some, but you can. This is comparisons that you can make with birds. Different shaped wings make for different lifestyles. So, you know, short rounded wings are good for moving through forests and really long pointed wings are good for long distance yep. soaring. And there's quite a few of them. So Pteranodon is one of them. There's a group called the Nyctosaurs um, who have these super long, really long pointed wings. The interpretation is they're sort of albatross, sort of globe trotting, you know, circling the world. They spent so much time on the wing, they lost their fingers because they, they barely spent any time on the ground. So the, the wings the wings actually don't have any fingers on them. They're really odd looking. Um, and yeah, even the really massive Ashdarkids, they've got, they've got all the relevant muscle attachments and keel bones and everything for powered flight, possibly even better than birds. Um, pterosaurs, birds actually take off in a really stupid way. They're really inefficient. <laughs> Because birds are descended from ground-dwelling dinosaurs, which were you know, running around on the ground on their back legs. So birds have quite big leg muscles. So when they fly, they kick off with their legs and then they start flapping, which means when they're in the air, they're carrying dead weight on them with all their leg muscles. Pterosaurs weren't doing that. Pterosaurs were walking around on all fours. So the muscles that powered flight also powered their walking and also powered takeoff. The the modeling there was modeling done a few years ago where they basically worked out that the way the pterosaurs would take off was basically to do a super massive push up, to do a really fast push up, and they're so lightweight that the power from these muscles just launched them straight up into the air, and then they could start flapping. That's a scary question. And then they don't have the dead weight, and then they don't have the dead weight of these big leg muscles that birds that have. It's quite a scary prospect, isn't it? I feel like that's. I feel like that's oh, yeah. something that you might need to animate for us so we can see it. 
there's a project. <laughs> Oh yeah, movie. well, there's it's been there's there's been doc, there's been documentaries, yeah, that in within recent years that I've shown it. Yeah, this this giraffe-sized animal just like springboarding itself off into the air. <laughs> I think it's fair to say that the whole that the, the whole dinosaur one hundred and one is terrifying in every sense of the word, isn't it? <laughs> Fascinating, <laughs> but equally terrifying. And for anybody, oh yeah, the 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 prehistoric world is. Full of weird, bizarre, <laughs> scary animals. And for uh, for anyone listening, and because we are sort of coming towards the end of our Dinosaur 101 time, and I do feel like we immediately ought to um, suggest a Dinosaur 201 and do a do a, do a kind of sequel, if you like. <laughs> oh yeah, I can I can keep going. <laughs> we have no doubt. We have no doubt about that. And. Uh, for, for anyone <laughs> listening, um, obviously, I hope you've enjoyed um, Dane talking about dinosaurs. It's a subject that he is intensely knowledgeable about, as you will know if you've listened to this podcast. Um, he's very passionate about it. And you can come and talk to him in person because we are heading um, to Litchfield Cathedral in Staffordshire on Wednesday, the 1st of November, where Dane will be um, talking about, amongst a number of other things, he'll be t- telling us about natural history and sustainability and some bits and pieces in relation to our um, presentations around the Gaia artwork. But also in between those sessions, Dane will be running his paleontology dinosaur workshop, which has been incredibly popular. Um, The last time we did it, he was inundated with visitors to that. And one thing that I wanted to just kind of finish off with on this is that um, I remember Dane telling me, the last time we did this workshop, he came. He came to me extremely excited, um, and he, he'd he'd had an interaction with um, a young man, I think, probably a young guy that had came off. Maybe he was seven or eight years of age or whatever. And he he told you that he desperately wanted to be a paleontologist um, when he grew up, and you were super enthusiastic because you'd got the opportunity to give him all of this information that wasn't given to you when you were a kid to learn how to get into that. So would you be able to enlighten us as to what you told that, um, you know, that young guy and how can people find out more about this stuff? How can they get into paleontology if that's something that they're really passionate about following? Yeah, definitely. Yeah. I was really, really excited to give this kid the opportunity because it was it was the sort of classic case when I was a kid, you know, I had all these big ideas. I want to be a scientist, I want to be a rock star, this, that, and the other. And then the school careers council would go, Oh, there's not a lot of job progression in that. Oh, there's not a lot of opportunity. Oh, you can't guarantee a good salary in that. And then you end up getting talked out of it. And I thought, no, I'm not having that happen. Some kids really interested in it. I'm going to give them everything they need. So I uh, I gave him uh, some information about some organizations you can get involved with. There's the um, Paleontological uh, Association, uh, which is a, a membership that you can get where they, they organize digs or excursions to mines and quarries, and you can actually get some hands-on field experience. Um, some events. There's uh, an event in uh, December in London called TetsuCon, which is run by uh, Dr. Darren Naish and John Conway. It's it's sort of like Comic-Con, but for people who work in natural history and paleontology. So there's scientists doing presentations, there's artwork, there's all sorts of things. It's a really good networking event. Um, Education-wise, you're, you know, you're going down to education. It depends on whether you're more interested in the biology side or the geology side, what kind of degree you want to pursue. There's a couple of universities that do a paleontology degree, but it is quite limited. Um, but sort of volunteering and just like getting your name out is a really good way to do it. You know, if you've got an, if you've got a museum with a natural if with a natural history department, just offering to go in and help with their collections because it's you know it's it's not a field that's swimming in money, despite what some <laughs> uh, what some voices might think. I, I, I see this all the time, like you know new new species being described, and I see people online going, "Oh, they're just making stuff up to make a bunch of money." And it's like, "Oh, I know so many people who would love to know where this money is coming from." <laughs> um, but yeah, so yeah, museums are always looking for volunteers. There's also yeah, there's paleontological association um society of vertebrate paleontology all sorts of organizations and events that you can go to um just get involved is the the takeaway from it whether it is through education or volunteering or going to events yeah just just getting involved and getting your foot in the door is the big step one excellent i think that's really good advice it's really good advice for any 
um, for any aspiring scientist to get involved, isn't it? So if you're into, um, you know, if you're into astronomy, go to your local astronomy club and all that type of stuff. So it's really, really sound advice. And maybe you would be so kind as to um, write us up maybe a little kind of, um, you know, synopsis of these organisations and um, places that you've mentioned there. And we can include that in, in the post that we eventually put at the bottom of this podcast. So people that are interested can find out a little bit more. You have also as well, and we can't we can't end the podcast without talking about your YouTube channel because, well, A, it's awesome, and B, <laughs> it's massive. So, yeah, Dane has got touching oh, on a it's... quarter of a million followers on YouTube. Uh, it, it's an insane number of people. Um, <laughs> so, uh, Dane, do you want to just tell us about your, your own outreach project and also your YouTube channel too? Yeah, so I've I've uh, I've built a bit of a, an online following doing um, animations, um, sort of mini natural history documentaries of prehistoric animals living their day to day lives, as well as infographics of like size comparisons, which are by far the biggest ones. I also have these little um, sort of spoken word uh, animated educational videos, a series I have called Fossil Fix, where I talk about specific topics within natural sciences and natural history. Um, and then every now and then I'll just have a random idea for a video that's got nothing to do with any of it, and I'll just throw that out there. I re- recently did a video about um, Metalocalypse, a cartoon about a uh, death metal band and how much I love that show. <laughs> so it's it's not mostly natural history, and then sometimes just, yeah, here's another I don't idea. know how many views you've got on that video, but I would think at least half of them are me. It's an, ama- it's an amazing video. <laughs> so we'll definitely link that one and uh, we'll link up your link up your Excellent. YouTube channel as well. Because I think um, uh, certainly plenty Lovely. of people clearly watch it already, but um, not enough people can watch it because the, the animations really are for, for those people that haven't seen it yet. And I would encourage you to um, to go and visit it. The animations are spectacular. They're, they're complex, they're clever, and they must take hours and hours to make. Yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> There's a lot. <laughs> it's it's not not a uh, a time not a uh, time effective. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, definitely not. But definitely worthwhile on the on the outset because there's you've got quite a large collection of videos on there and they're really interesting and your channel's just a great place to be anyway because it is a mixture as you say of these things that are natural history focused there there is some paleontology stuff in there and there's also some stuff in there that's quite personal to you as well isn't there so it's a it's an interesting place to be if you want to find out more about Dane and there's plenty plenty to find out and of course I think I think I just I think I I think I described my channel once as a, an ongoing identity <laughs> crisis because there, there's no real focus like it's that. just <laughs> But it's an identity crisis that's interesting to follow, for sure. So, uh, yeah. <laughs> Let's watch this man's <laughs> descent. <laughs> oh, hilarious. Well, thank you so much, Dane, for all of your um, information and your expertise. It's been an absolute pleasure to um, to do this episode with you, and we definitely must do a, a, a follow-up to it. And maybe... Um, with a- Oh yes, oh yeah. I've 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 barely I've barely even touched on the notes I made for this episode. <laughs> yeah, I feel notes. like we could have like a, a, we, we could go for the podcast world record. I don't know what that is, but oh, <laughs> uh. there's, a, there's a challenge to throw down. And um, again, you can also oh, find dear. lots of um, lots of Dane's work on the Average Scientist. He he writes regularly for us on a variety of different subjects, and we will link all of his articles on the Average Scientist below um, below the podcast as well. So. Dane, thank you so much for spending the time with us. It's been a pleasure. Yeah, thank I will you. I will look forward I will look Thanks forward for to seeing me. you very soon at Litchfield when we will um t- talk more Excellent. about um earth and natural sciences and um sustainability and of course dinosaurs as well. So if you are in the area at Staffordshire Wednesday the 1st of November, average scientists will be there all day. We're giving task talks at various intervals during the day and our science hub will be in place for the the whole of that day of which Dane will be a very prominent feature with his collection of paleontology related materials, activities, (laughs) artifacts, and of course, more of his amazing knowledge. So Dane, thanks so much for, for spending the time with us. Yes. Thank you, Dane. (laughs) Thanks for having me. We will return with episode five of the TAS podcast within the next two or three weeks. I think um, Bex and I are going to be kicking around the subject of Egyptology. And Bex, for those those people who 
can't see, which is everybody basically but Dane and I, is doing a sport <laughs> dance. This, is... this, this <laughs> makes great television. Yeah, e- Egyptology <laughs> is one of Bex's real, um, yeah, it's one of your real passions. It's one of the, it's something that you love talking about, love thinking about, isn't it? So I'm going to be really excited. It's another podcast where I basically just get the hour off and listen, <laughs> which has been a real <laughs> nice thing for me to do today. Uh, so I'm really, I'm very much looking forward to that. So keep a lookout. Was it? <laughs> yeah, it, yeah. Are they? Are the pyramids connected to a large <laughs> column that travels to the centre of the Earth? I'm going to line up all of the terrible questions to ask to people that they must have had <laughs> lasers. <laughs> Brilliant! I feel like we should get Dane involved in this podcast. He's already caught with two corkers. <laughs> <laughs> oh, perfect. Well, thank you very much, guys. We'll be back on um, episode five within the next couple of weeks, and um, we'll look forward to speaking to you all then. The Average Scientist, making science accessible for everyone. 